14 months ago, I started making videos about stereos because I love talking about them. And I knew that there was a lot to learn, but I hoped that one day I could make a living doing that. And on the road to that goal, there's been many milestones. And today we're checking off another one, which is my first service. This Pioneer SX650 was sent to me by a fellow named Randy. And he mentioned that the funnel section was having some problems and that most of the lamps are burned out. But the goal for this video is just to fix everything that we come across and do it as good as I can so that hopefully at the end of the video, it still works. Thanks for trusting me with this one, Randy. So this is kind of my first service I'm doing for someone else's receiver. Even though I've fixed things and sold them to people, this is not my receiver and I'm fixing it and then sending it back to someone. And that's a little nerve wracking, but so far I haven't had any issues. So I'm hoping it all works out. A couple of months ago, I sold a Pioneer SX636 that I had restored to a fellow in Utah named Randy. A week after he received it, he informed me that he and his grandson had been listening to vinyl together, and his grandson loved it. He also mentioned that his original Pioneer SX650 was no longer functioning and wondered if it might be fixed. Oh, it looks like there's a, a lamp kit. Oh, he included the new lamps with it. My favorite thing about this series of Pioneers is how they have this on the back so that you can connect easily. And it, I, I don't know, this is just, the, these sorts of, I don't know if they're better, but I feel like they should be, you know? We got power light, we got relay, and no bright bulb. I think he said that Fano has some crackles. We have zero millivolts of DC on that channel. This channel says we have 47 millivolts of DC, so that's quite a bit. A little crackle. Come on. Let's try that Fano input. This is on aux. So I'm using a reverse filter, basically, that makes it sound like a turntable. And then that way I can just plug my phone into it. It's just a Hagerman Labs reverse R. Uh, it's the IRIAA filter, but I built a nice little wood box for it because I wanted to. <laughs> nice. I don't hear any, any a little loud there. I don't hear any issues with it. So I'm kind of thinking that it's mostly just lamps. Both meters are working great. I've got it hooked up to an antenna. Looks like our stereo indicator bulb is probably burned out, but nice and smooth on the knob there. <laughs> Look at how far that goes. So nice. I love that. Cool. And works great as well. Before I took it apart, I used a soft brush and a vacuum to clean off dust, then wiped the back down with a damp microfiber. To clean the inputs and outputs, I used quick dry electronics cleaner and made sure it was all dried up. Then I applied some Deoxit D100L to all of the threaded connectors, RCA jacks, and speaker connections. I want to do more services, but I also have tons of my own projects to do, so I just took this one on because he purchased the other receiver. However, if you're interested in having something serviced, I'll leave the current details on what I'm offering in the pinned comment below. Wow. All right, so it's actually looking really clean inside, which is awesome for how old it is. And this is the original owner I got it from. There's a smudge on the inside of the dial frame, so we're gonna clean that as well. I think it's important to start with the most basic levels of service first, cleaning the exterior, controls, and inputs. It's so common for one of those to cause crackling or other issues, so it's good to eliminate them first. I also find that a working piece that looks good sounds better than one that's unkept. And I enjoy the added bonus of hidden treasures found deep within. Ooh, got a dead moth in there. Bit of a cocoon Over there. Over time, I would love to acquire all of the skills to take a destroyed piece and resurrect it back to nearly mint condition. Whether it's screen printing, metal work, or custom circuit boards. I've realized that I really enjoy the process of learning all of these skills and applying them to beautiful devices. For now though, I'm happy with clearing out old moth homes and using magic erasers to wipe away years of dust. Looks like we have to pull off this whole plastic piece on top, the diffuser. I just disassembled a Pioneer SX3700 that had a very similar diffuser. And then my Pioneer SX550 that I'm gonna do some work on also has a diffuser like this. And these bulbs pop out the bottom. It's just a, seems like it should be a socket, right? You look at it and you're like, oh, the bulb is socketed in there, but then you pull back the sleeve and the bulbs are actually soldered in place. The LEDs that we have are meant for a wedge socket. It looks like for the stereo indicator bulb, we just have this one screw over here. I think this whole, yeah, look at that. 
this whole panel holds the meters in place as well. If we pull these meters out, there's no lights in there. Nice. This bulb out the front. Thankfully, they're not glued in. In the 636 I worked on, they were just glued into the sockets and they were a pain to get out. You gotta do this in order too. It's so easy <laughs> to put the bulb in and then not put this on and then you're like, oh wait, I have to put the wires through the, the through this. Uh, so make sure that you do it in order, but then you can just stuff that in there and then we'll do the other thing. Same thing for the other side. Thankfully, the wedge lamps had bent wire leads that I could wrap the wire onto and solder in place. Not such a difficult job if you know how to solder. Nice. So this, this LED had so much extra wire that I just trimmed the leads down to only that long. And then I just put a little heat shrink tubing over the splice. Basically, I wrapped the wires around each other, put a little solder, and then put the heat shrink tubing over it. And then this one, I left the wires kind of long and just folded them up into this wire holder here, just in case someone needs extra wire in the future. And it's important that you make sure that none of the wiring for the lamps is touching the string for the tuner back here because it'll make it not run as smooth. Let's give it a quick turn on and see what that looks like. Love it. Lovely power light. Oh, yep. Look at that. Lovely stereo indicator bulb working great now. Just using my finger as an antenna. All right, so next I wanna clean all of these switches in here just to make sure they last a long time. I also want to clean the power switch and it looks like the easiest way to get into it is actually gonna be to remove this whole black panel here. So we need to start by lifting the this needle out of the way and then we will guide the string out of the way as we pull it off. But there's a number of washers and nuts that go back onto specific controls, so I'd recommend taking a photo of this plate before removing it. There's also a hidden screw behind the dial string that eluded me for a minute. I started by removing loose dust from the board, then sprayed a quick dry contact cleaner into the controls. Once it was dry, I lubricated the potentiometers with Deoxit F100, and the switches with the Deoxit D100L. Alrighty, so I've started putting this back together and I just, it's interesting because I'm so used to doing full recaps on things, full rebuilds, replacing all the transistors and stuff. It feels almost wrong to put this back together because I haven't replaced everything, but uh, that's, that's what I'm doing for this. This is just a little service to get all the lights working again and took it apart, cleaned all the switches. It seems like this unit has been taken really good care of because it doesn't have uh, there, there are a couple known bad transistors in here. We have a couple, I think they're two SC 1344s. And normally the legs on those get really black and that's what causes them to go bad, all that corrosion buildup. And these ones have no corrosion on the legs. So this unit either just has a good batch of those transistors or it's just very low hours. It just hasn't been used very much. Alrighty, time to put the faceplate back on. See how it looks. Let me throw these couple washers on here. Wash this on. I'm not the biggest fan of the cold LEDs. They, they definitely have a different look to them than I'm used to. I usually like the, the warmer LEDs. At this point, I had completed all of the services that Randy had asked for. So I sent him an email to let him know and see if he wanted anything else done to it. So it's a couple days later and I heard back from Randy and he was actually surprised that I didn't have any issues with the Fano section. So off camera, I'm planning to do a bit more long-term testing on it, but first he wanted me to recap it as well as do any preventative maintenance that I would recommend. So I pulled this bottom cover off and it's pretty obvious that it's pretty dusty, but you know what's not obvious is electricity. Unlike woodworking and unlike dusting things, you can't see when there's danger with electricity. Most of the time you can't even hear it. And if you are uncomfortable being around high voltages that will shock you and potentially be lethal, then don't do this part also, you need to be very careful around electricity. Got the cover all cleaned up, and now we are on to the invisible work. It took me a couple of weeks to get back to working on this. I went on a road trip down the west coast to visit some family and friends, which was lovely. I'm happy to be back in town now and working on this again, and can't wait to get it done. I'm also stoked because I picked up a couple more projects on the trip that I'm excited about. The first thing I checked was the power supply and power amp voltages, and there was nothing out of spec. Love to see it. Also, I found a bonus gift. This is the third moth I've found now in this receiver. Then I looked at the Fano section. There's eight capacitors that I'm going to replace. Four of which are these small blue tantalum capacitors. The Fano circuit, Fano amp, or Fano stage are all different names for the same thing. 
a circuit that amplifies the quiet signal that a turntable sends out to the same level as say the signal from your phone or a cassette deck so that it can be sent through the same preamp and power amp as those other signals. Everyone has their methodology behind replacing various capacitors and they can certainly have an impact on the sound. In this case, I used three different types of capacitors for various applications in the Fano circuit. Once I finished removing the old ones and installing the new ones, I soldered them all in place. Then I cleaned the board off with rubbing alcohol. So these are all the components that I pulled out of that Fano stage and all of these ones tested fine. These two over here, this one tested just outside of the 20% tolerance in capacitance. And then this tantalum capacitor measured significantly higher ESR than the other three, and so it's also a standout. All right, so in the spirit of making sure that everything I do is actually an improvement to this amp, we're gonna test the Fano stage to make sure that it still works. Look for the bright bulb in the back there on my dim bulb tester. A Little bit of bright bulb. We get a relay click. Great, all right, now we've got speakers connected, and now let's go ahead and play some music. Getting great sound out of both channels. Very clean, very nice, we like. Just to make sure the Fano input was working, I listened to both sides of our record through it and it sounded great. If you turned the volume up with nothing playing, there was a wee bit of hiss, so I went ahead and removed the ground connections, burnished the surfaces with sandpaper, and soldered them in place. This made the hiss a little bit quieter. All right, the next area we're looking at is the amplifier board, which I just removed with these two screws over here. I noticed a couple of heat damaged capacitors and four small value caps that I wanted to test and replace. So as you can see, this capacitor still tests fine, even though that lining is starting to recede. Same with the other capacitor that's even worse off. Once again, heat damage, but it's not actually affecting the capacitor, at least in this limited test that we're doing. Be suspicious of the small value capacitors in your old equipment. They tend to go bad sooner than larger ones. Ooh, as you can tell, this capacitor is very bad. ESR exceeding 40 ohms, which is incredibly high. The other three small value capacitors tested better than that one, but still out of spec. For the two smallest values, I replaced them with these red film capacitors for better lifespan. All right, so I replaced a few other capacitors on the board. I replaced a few below these, two below the heat sinks. One of them was really glued on, so I took off all the old glue down there. And they both tested pretty fine, but they were close to 20% out of spec, so we replaced them. The other thing that I'm doing is replacing the heat sinks here, or not replacing them, just cleaning all the old thermal paste off and putting new thermal paste on. Thermal paste gets crusty over time and doesn't transfer heat as well. Another common issue with these transistors is cold solder joints. They can get hot enough to melt part of the solder that holds them in, which weakens the joint. So when I soldered all of the new capacitors in place, I also reflowed the transistor solder. All of these bigger ones tested fine. The only thing was that the foil was peeling back on some of them, and then, and then this one I just took out to test, and it didn't test poorly, but it is bulging a little bit, it looks like. But these all tested horrible, with the worst one being the 4.7 microfarad we tested that was over 40 ohms ESR. Alrighty, once again, we're here to see if my work worked, and we'll watch for this bright light, and then hopefully it fades. All right, we're back at a scene which might look familiar, which is the preamp. I removed the faceplate and the black plates that cover the front of all these controls because there are a few capacitors that we're gonna replace in here. And those transistors I mentioned earlier in the video that I said usually they go bad, but this must be a good batch, we're just gonna replace those. We also have some orange capacitors in here, which are Sanyo, and those are generally considered to go bad. On this board, I replaced six capacitors, including the two blue tantalum drops. And on this board, I replaced three capacitors and one KSE 1344 transistor. This is everything we replaced. These three are bad, very high ESR. And as we expected, these orange ones are bad. So these ones all tested good, including the transistor, which tested very healthy. Normally you would see, you can kind of see how there's a bit of blackening going on on the legs just barely. All right, so that wraps up all of the electrical work. Now we just have a few other cosmetic things to take care of, but first, you know what we're doing? We're looking back there for a bright bulb. If we have our dim bulb tester turned on, <laughs> now we got a bright bulb and it went away and we got a relay click, so that's a good sign. And we have audio. I checked all our channels, 
Fauno already tested. This is aux. We've got FM and we've got AM. So the only thing left to do now is re-glue all of these knobs. The inserts are coming out of them. I use JB Weld's two-part auto epoxy for things like this because it's so convenient and it's very strong. After mixing it up, I pulled the plastic insert out of each knob, applied a dab of epoxy, and smeared it around inside of the bottom of the knob, then slid the insert back inside. I then put the knob onto the shaft to check alignment and used a pair of tweezers to adjust the insert so that the knob was perfectly aligned with the lines on the faceplate. For the lever covers, I only applied a small dab of epoxy to the end of the insert, and you want to make sure you've aligned them properly before sliding the insert in all of the way because it won't come back out. It felt both exciting and surreal to put the wood case back on this, knowing that the work was done. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to work on someone else's gear. I've now been testing it in my living room for a few days and it works great, but it's time to pack it back up and send it back to its home where I hope it'll serve many more years of enjoyment. Thanks for watching.